So yeah, I'm I'm working on a picture of political health work because I'm not here to push any um, like corporate agenda today. Um, and I'm in fact going to um, show you a small trick of how to deal with companies such as ours a little bit later. And um, the main subject I'm going to talk about is something which is I think very relevant to software sustainability and um, productivity, and that is how well Dao Dao Rudy all the systems we're using are we are using for research work with each other. And as you might know that if there is a question used as for a title, then the answer is no. So uh, I'm going to show you some examples. Um, there was this correspondence in Nature, like in December last year, which caught my eye because it's. At first, it looks very funny. Someone asking for the USB ports to be um, maintained as a future-proof way to connect devices. Um, and as we know, at least one major um, laptop manufacturer started um, not putting USB ports anymore on their uh, laptops. So there is some truth there. And the example it had was about a spectroscopic device that he couldn't use anymore because the software and hardware couldn't connect to anything uh, they had in the lab. And I actually visited a um, similar lab uh, sometime last year, um, where they have like very expensive spectroscopic uh, equipment, and it's not a small lab, it's quite a well-known one. And what caught my eye there was that they had a postdoc student, which uh, did his PhD in uh, nanomaterials. And what he was doing for this postdoc was he was writing a piece of software to get data from all these devices and upload it somewhere in the cloud. Which is, I guess it's a nice thing to do, but to me it seems like a waste of human resources, because if you have, have someone with their PhD in physics, you probably want them to do something better than it build some software to upload data somewhere in the cloud. So I guess this is somehow another example of um, things not working as they should. And there is a slide from SDN. I'm, I'm sorry, this is not to show a negative example, but I was wondering when I'd seen the slide um, in this whole workflow that, well, for good or not so good reasons, we had to go through. Um, I guess there are some systems involved in it and I was wondering how well do the systems talk with each other and how much manual labor is still expected from the various participants in order to make all this workflow um, end. Um, so the question, and this is one of the things I do for work, is trying to understand how I can make not only like feature but all the systems that are, for example, in that, big, in that big wheel of scholarly communication innovations work with each other. And one of the most, most like, let's say, natural responses I've seen to this is, well, we need to come up with a new standard, of course. Um, we will develop a standard that will, um, will be the last one and it will work all over the place and everyone will implement it and so on. And, um, as an exercise, I work a lot of uh, bibliographic metadata, and I started writing down all the standards I know. And I, you may see that I, I, I haven't been working in this long, like I don't know, three, four years. And I could go on with this kind of standards, and probably creating a new one is not such a good idea. And that's not only my feeling, for example, I'm part of a um, working group from Metadata 2020, which its own purpose, sole purpose is to try to convert all this, all this long list of standards into one that will be accepted by the whole community and will be, as I say, a single entry point. And on this topic of convergence, there's this project in uh, the UK uh, by JISC, maybe some of you have seen it, um, which did a very interesting thing. Um, what they did is that they brought together a lot of um, software vendors in the uh, scientific research area, and they told us, look guys, we, we know that if you, will be, if you are to communicate with one another to build integrations between you, it will take like 20 years, and you probably won't do it anyway. 
so we are going to build an interface that's somehow like a message bus, a message layer they call it. And you will have to connect to this interface, you will have to respect this interface, and we will ensure that whoever connects to the interface can talk with any other system um, um, participating, in it, participating in it. And the types of systems they consider are institutional repositories, data repositories, and archiving solutions mostly, also Chris systems and so on. And there are some things which maybe would have been done better, but I think the, the most important thing they managed to do is bring together all these vendors and force them to um, work with each other um, in a way which makes the uh, work of institutions that have to use one or more of such systems uh, makes their lives easier. Um, and again, of course, there were some commercial incentives for, uh, for the companies that are involved and so on, but I think this is one great way to achieve interoperability. Um, there is also this example which nowadays maybe it's not so popular, but I think is one of the areas in which the um, research domain and the uh, academic area of the domain um, really excels, and that is single sign-on. Um, and for example, what um, things like EduGain did was that once, um, let's say, a service provider like us um, complies with the protocols they developed, we can know for sure that whenever a new institutional client, for example, comes in, we will be able to um, integrate with their single sign-on solution in like two or three hours of work. So this is, I think, another great example of um, systems working very well together. Uh, but there was a lot of effort uh, done uh, in order to get here. Um, and of course there are some other ways in which we could be forced to, um, let's say, um, work with other systems. So because GitHub is so popular nowadays, you will see like GitHub integrations with all the major repositories, the Noble feature and so on. And uh, yeah, in some ways we can't go around this because everyone uses it. Um, also, there are big players like Google, which what they tell you is that if you want to be indexed, and I mean everyone wants to have their paper indexed by Google Scholar, then the repository will need to implement, for example, double, double core metadata and, and embed it in the HTML uh, um, pages. And nowadays there is schema.org, which is very useful, for example, for data sets, and you need to uh, have um, a JSON LD snippet in your page. So in some way they force you to implement standards which won't be used only by Google but by everyone that wants to scrape information from a repository, for example. But what do you do if you are not like one of the big players or maybe you don't have the same leverage over um, commercial entities? Well, the one way which I've seen that works really well uh, I mean, at least for us, but I'm sure that also any commercial vendor is that whenever you try to... Um, so, there will be a time when you'll have to purchase a solution, a commercial solution. Um, and maybe you are involved in this, maybe you are the one deciding uh, what system you will buy, or maybe you, you are the one that is, uh, asks for such a system. And I think one way in which you can ensure that um, whatever you buy will play nicely will be what you already have is to ask for that um, and not just make like um, make it an, an optional requirement but make it one of your top requirements make it mandatory so for example OAAPMH it's quite an old standard maybe it's not the best example but I've seen a lot of this kind of request for proposals or however you want to call them which still ask for OAPMH and most of them have, they have it in the mandatory section so we need to have it and in the same way you can ask for like integrations with if you buy uh, let's say a repository with Chris systems or you can make sure that whatever you are buying will play nicely with your uh, scientific computing platform and so on 
And whenever you put such requirements in your request, um, a few things will happen. Um, first of all, you will filter probably those vendors which don't want to implement these things because they think it's a waste of time and they don't care about the other systems you might have. Um, this, I think, um, it's not maybe the main thing you are trying to achieve, but what will happen more importantly is that you will um, make them think about their strategy, their long-term strategy. Because if we see like enough times the same thing being told to us, like we need to implement these standards because it will help us integrate with the other systems we have and so on, then we will then start to implement them proactively. So we won't wait for you to come again to us and say, look, we need you to have this uh, interface in order for us to buy your system or similar. Um, and with this thing though, I'm, I'm gonna uh, leave you with um, three, um, let's say, things you can do to improve it, uh, interoperability in research software. And I've split this into the three main categories of people that might be in this room, but I'm sure I forgot one type for another, so uh, I'll be happy to discuss this afterwards. Um, so if you're a developer, a software source software developer, or a vendor that develops such software, I think, nowadays you need to put interoperability in your top three priorities. So in the same way you have, for, for example, user uh, privacy and uh, for GDPR nowadays, or you have um, uh, data persistence for research data or software. I think you need to also think about how your whatever software you are developing will play in the large ecosystem of research software. Um, it's not. It's no longer something that you can say, well, this is nice to have, I'll think about it after I reach, I don't know, one million users or so on. It's something that you need to have in your mind from the beginning, uh, from the first day you start working on your uh, research application. Um, I call them facilitators, but basically these are the people that um, do this most of the times. Other people that will uh, are in charge of <coughs> purchasing and making sure that um, any research system is implemented at the institution. Um, you should you, you need to be very strict about what you buy, as I said, and you need to ensure that whatever vendor you are choosing won't build a walled garden around their system. Um, and I don't want to offend anyone here, but I would say that this category of people are not is doing the best job in some way at ensuring this. Um, because as I said, I've seen a lot of these requests for proposals and so on, and it seems to me that um, people start understanding that whatever they buy, they need to think about the long-term strategy and how whatever they are buying will work in their ecosystem of research software. And the last category is researchers, and frankly, you shouldn't have to worry about these things. You shouldn't, if you did your PhD in physics, you shouldn't have to go to your postdoc and write software to connect whatever devices have in your lab laboratory. If you, have, if you want to do this, maybe have a hobby, sure, but in your day-to-day -day work, you shouldn't have to worry about the tools you have and how well they work with each other. But of course, I know we don't live in, in a utopia, so what you need to do is, you need to have your um, voice heard and you need to ensure that, especially the first two categories of people, know that one of the most important things to you is that how well the different tools you are using work with each other. Um, and this is why I think research should also be included in, uh, for example, in the uh, purchasing uh, process and so on, the various tools. It shouldn't be a, a, a workflow in which a tool is imposed to a researcher, but the researcher should have like direct input on what tools are um, considered. Um, so yeah, I'm, I would be really grateful if I could hear from you success stories on this or even nightmare stories on this. And even more important, how do you um, how do you work in order to ensure that the, all the systems you have in your research ecosystem work together? Um, and that's it. Thank you very much.